Brother Patrick, would you come tonight? I release you to minister whatever the word is that God has in your heart. Thank you, Let's get back on that blood real quick. The blood of Jesus. There's a misconception that it says, oh, just one drop of his blood could have taken my sins. Well, you know something? The Father struck him, poured his wrath, and Jesus poured out all his blood. That's right. So it didn't just take one drop. God said, they're so wicked, they're so filthy. Patrick Wilder is going to be so much of a drug addict that, son, I'm going to put you on the scourging post, and then I'm going to, I'm going to nail you to the tree, and your blood's going to pour out, and they're going to humiliate you, and you're going to have the taste of their spit on your face. And that's what it's going to take. So it's not a prick of his finger that, 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 that cleansed me up. It's not what set us all free. It was God pouring out his wrath to the point that when they stabbed him in his side, water had to come out because there was no blood left. So that's why we preach about the blood. Okay? It's it, this thing of, oh, it, all it took was just a little drop and it cleansed me all up. No, there was a price for our sin. Every decision I made for drugs and for alcohol, every time I made that decision, it was a scar upon his back. And he looked at the Father and said, I'll pour it out still. I'll pour it out still. So that's, that's the mini-sermon. That was free. All of it's free. Because I didn't pay anything to receive salvation. And remember, Jesus said, I have chosen you. You didn't choose me. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and I have called you. And everybody in here has a calling from God. There's nobody here that God has forgotten about. Amen. You may think that, but I pray that tonight you will think otherwise because I believe God is in the house and when you talk about His blood, the Father's going to move. Amen. Anytime you need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of salvation. It alone can save you. I'm not going to be able to save you. I'm not going to be able to prophesy to you. But if God speaks... I will tell you what I feel God has said. And I fear the Lord. I want you to know that. I fear God when I speak. I don't speak anything of my own because my words will fall. I will miss it. But if I speak for God, he, he told Samuel, I will not let one of your words fall. And Samuel didn't have that. He didn't have the cross. He, he wasn't able to come into the holiest of holies. And we can, each and every one of us. So I want us to worship tonight. I want, I want you to want something from God. I want you to want something from God so bad that you're not walking out the doors until you receive it. There's an abundance tonight. All you have to do, you don't even have to reach out. All you have to say is, God, I receive it. That's all you have to do. I feel if people want to get baptized in the Holy Ghost tonight, I thought about that earlier. I feel there's a stirring right now. Jesus is the baptizer. Yes. Not me, and it's not the oil. The oil that I heard smells funny. <laughs> well, we won't talk about that. We won't talk about that. But if you got your Bibles tonight, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I just want to say I'm so, so humbled and honored to be here. I, I, love, I love this house. This is the first time I've ever been here, and I love it. I love it. I can see on the ground there's stains of blood. And when I walk into the house, that's what I look for. I want to make sure that the carpet is vacuumed, but it doesn't vacuum up the blood. And that's what I want. I see blood on the altars. That means the Son of God is here. And I praise Him for that. While you get there to 1 Corinthians 15, somebody shout out an amen to me. Amen. Uh, we learned from this morning. <laughs> I'm at the right church tonight. Hallelujah. Well, let's just, let's just go to the Lord in prayer before we read the word, okay? Father God, we thank you and we glorify you. Surely, Lord God, surely you are here in this place. And Father, we proclaim that this worship, that we have come together and we have sang and lifted up our hands, none of that was for us. It was all for you. 
All the worship is for you, Lord God. All the shouts are for you, Lord God. All the hands lifted up. It's hands that were filthy, but yet you by your blood have made holy. Everything is for you, Lord God. And we, when we offer unto you shouts of praise, and we proclaim that you are worthy, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we honor you. Father, I ask for an unction and an utterance of your spirit, Lord God. I ask that you come through even with a steady hand and minister to each person in their hearts, Father God, deeply tonight. And stir up, Father God, all that you would. And as we leave, may we know that Jesus Christ was exalted and he brought us closer unto himself. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. I believe God's giving me a message for tonight. So we're just going we to preach a little bit, okay? 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go with... Well, since it says preach, let's go verse 11. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so he believed. How do you know you got to believe first? Amen. Remember, uh, I think it's John 1, 12 says, Yet as many as received him... To them he gave the power to become the sons and daughters of God. So God wants us to come into his kingdom. He does. But he doesn't want us to put up the rapture tent. He wants us to keep walking. He wants us to keep fellowshipping. And in that there's a power as we walk with God. As we walk through trials. As, as we walk into times of praise and of worship. And of babies being born. And of babies dying. We walk closer and closer that we may receive the promise of God and also the power to become his son and to become his daughter. Hallelujah. Verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also in vain. Yea, that we were found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he was not raised up. If so be that the dead rise not. God's going to clarify a lot of this. Verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and ye are yet in your sins. Now, that's a lot of King James there. So, I praise God for the King James, and then I praise God for not using the King James every now and then. But in that, it's interesting that it says, now we preach because you have believed. The believing comes through the pronunciation and the pro proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Am I right? Yes, sir. How would we know unless we hear the gospel what God has done? There's so many people who, who they go to churches, but they don't hear the gospel. Okay? It's not every church that preaches the gospel. So they live in church their entire lives. And when they encounter people who love God and who love his gospel and have been transformed by the gospel, they think we're fanatics. Guess what? We're in a radical group here. Yes, sir. I'm in church twice. On a Sunday? Come on. Man, you folks are over the top. But that's the world, isn't it? Yes. And it's funny because Paul says there's discussion among you that there is no resurrection. Is that not 2014? Is that not the body of Christ? Come on. I mean, we've got denominations changing their doctrines right now yeah. of saying, well, we should believe he did. And see, that's where, we, that's where we're at. And that's why when we go outside these walls, that's what we better know. You guys heard my testimony today. God brought me from a very dark place. And it is because he rose again. That's why. That's why. He couldn't set me free from the grave. He couldn't, be, he couldn't set me free if he was bound up. He couldn't do any of that. So Paul was preaching to church people. Somebody say church people. church people. These are church people. They float in the gifts of the Spirit. 
We, we could even say these are probably some Pentecostals. They float in the gifts and they love the gifts. They love the tongues and interpretation so much that they just kept using it over and over in the services. And Paul said, slow up, slow down, let's do things in order. Let's do things in order because everything needs to be done in order. But we have this teaching that all of a sudden Paul is saying, I've preached and you have believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now you know for a fact that when Paul came there, he preached what? Jesus Christ died for your sins. He, he placed your sins upon himself. He died on the cross. He gave his life up. Because remember, Paul knew through revelation and, and, and intimacy with God, he knew that Jesus had the power. Jesus had to give up his life. And do you know that unless, we, unless he took our sin upon him, he couldn't die? Because the wages of sin is death. Right. So he couldn't die. They could have gotten the, the largest army in all of the world and come against him. And he could not die. They could beat his body and yet he would not die. Why? Because he was sinless. Yes. Because he had no sin. Yes. So when he said, Father, not mine, but thine will be done. The purest form of God that anyone has ever seen. Step down. Amen. And look, just like you and me. That's it. Yes. Do you know he cried when he was a baby? Mm -hmm. He hurt when people said stuff about him. Yeah. He, 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 his feelings were probably hurt when somebody thought he was a little awkward. But he didn't curse them. He didn't, he didn't destroy them like we do. But yet he said, Father, you love them. That's what he repeated in his ministry. He said, you love them, Father. You love them. And so he continued in what he did. And then he went to the cross. And then he gave himself completely and poured himself out. The Son of God who was spotless, was pure, and was holy. In Philippians 2, it lists it, and it's just amazing stuff. It says he gave himself of no reputation. He never wanted to be acknowledged as anything. Isaiah 53 said he was a root out of dry ground. There was no comeliness to him. People turned their faces away from him. He wasn't a Hollywood person. He was a Jewish man who loved the Father more than anyone. And he chose to walk the Father's plan through it all. And through it all, he did that. And he said, not mine, nothing will be done. And the whole time in his mind, he knew at some point he was going to have to take my addiction and put it on his body. He knew that they were going to lay him down and they were going to grab that hammer and drive it into his hands because I chose to sin. And he took my sin, and he took your sin, and he placed it upon his body. And then they lifted up the tree, and he prophesied it before. He says, the Son of Man will be lifted up, and then what? He will draw all men into himself. He knew what was going to happen. He knew it all. And that's why he cried out from the cross. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because even though he was the son of God and he was fully man, yet the sins were upon his body for the first time. He tasted sin. And it wasn't just a little sin here or a little sin there. It was all of our sins at one time put upon his body. And he tasted the sin. He tasted the filth. He tasted all of my sins. And the father was so grieved that his pure son who came from him now he's seated at the right hand of God, but he came from the Father, out of the Father. Yes. The Father looked away. Yes. And he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, I have, son, so when they come to me, I will never forsake them. Yes. See, the Son had to be forsaken first yes. because our sin was the judgment. The wages of sin are death. If that's the only bit of the gospel that we preach, then we're missing the power. The sacrifice was done, but now what do we do? Remember what he said? He says, no one takes my life, but I give it freely. 
And then he prophesied. And he says, but the Father has given me commandment that you will be raised up again. He says, I have the power to take it back up. Why? Because the Father says, now, go down into the depths and rescue my people. He found you. He found me. He had to find us. He had to come looking for us. He knew where we were. He knew we'd be in the pit. He knew we'd be in the slums. He knew we'd be in the bars. But he burged right in and says, devil, give me the keys. In Ephesians 4, it talks about that, that he went into the lower parts of the earth. It literally says, before he ascended, he descended. And if you take that scripture with the verses of the Gospels, remember, he, he, told, he told Mary, he says, don't cling on to me. I have not yet ascended. Three days. He had not yet gone up to the Father. Because he went down to defeat hell and death first. Do you hear me? Hell and death was gone. He took the keys from the devil. And I'll tell you, I swear, I, would, I wish I would have been there. Just to see that devil bow at the scarred body of my Savior. When all my sin was upon him. Yeah. Yeah. And so he went there. And then on the third day, he rose again. Yes. Yes. That's why we're here tonight. Yes. And prophetically, that's why you're a pastor here. Yes. That's the point of this church. That's the calling of this church. Yes. This church is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. Not everybody wants to be the resurrection because the resurrection takes everybody in. Come on. We're not going to pick and choose, house. You better get ready. Come on. You better get ready to put on the armor of God and be willing to fight for the souls coming in here. Because I'm telling you, I can hear the devil screaming. I've been part of deliverance services. I've heard them demons talk. But also I've heard Jesus say, I silence you. Not a peep. When authority comes, the demon runs to the foot of the authority and says, Thou son of God, what have I to do with thee? There's authority in the resurrection. God's not going to put you in the middle of a fist fight with your, with your hands tied behind your back. Right. He's going to come with a table right before you and say, sit down. Because I'm going to do the victory yeah. here. Why? Because he rose again from the dead. Oh, do you see what Paul's saying here? He says, these people, I've taught you. You've believed. But yet, there's discussion among you about the resurrection. See, they've got a bunch of theologians around. Come on. You know what theologians are about? Most of it's religion. And religion gets kicked right out that door. Because you will not fulfill the calling of God for your life if you're religious. Religious is a bunch of calculations. Well, I know Jesus rose from... I mean, did he really? You see what I'm saying? And that's what they started doing. And Paul heard about this. And the Spirit of God says, write to them now. Because what my sister did up here is nobody takes God's glory. The reason Moses was put in authority is because Moses would only give it back to him. When you're writing for the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit literally told him, says, now the man Moses was the most humble person on the face of the earth. Huh? I mean, he wrote that. Moses wrote that, that he was the most humble man because God saw him. And rem remember, Moses premeditated murder. Yeah. Okay, let's just throw that out there. Yeah. I do prison ministry. So we talked about that God loves convicts. He loves them. Absolutely loves them. What did it say Moses did? It says Moses saw that and he went like this. You, you know why he looked around? He says, I'm fitting to kill this guy. And I want to make sure nobody's looking. Yeah. And then you know what he did? Yeah. He, he got rid of the body. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Can we see that there's a problem? Yeah. Now from that, Jehovah met him at the bush. You will find no place in this book where it lists the details where God dealt with him about it. Nowhere. It never says, Moses, I will use you if you do this, this, and this about that murder, I want you to go serve your time first. 
It never says that. Why? Because God knew it was going to get dealt with because God knew Jesus Christ would rise from the dead. Amen. There is, there's no power without the resurrection of God. Our faith is literally in vain. Now listen to some of these definitions. This is interesting because vain is used in two different verses. Look at verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith also in vain. Vain there means empty. Empty handed by extension. Vain, ineffective, useless, foolish. Meaning if we preach the gospel and Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, we're, our words are empty. You know what that means? It means it won't do anything. It means it won't change you. Now look at verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Now this is interesting because now it dealt with preaching the word. But now it gets a little deeper to where it says, if Christ be not raised, this is vain, but yet you and I are still in our sins. Do you see what I'm saying? Now vain there means worthless. Futile or futile, useless, empty. Futile in the definitions is, is incapable of producing any useful result. It's pointless. And what that means is if, if Christ be not raised and we are yet in our sins, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. And I'll tell you what, the toughest thing is when you go preaching the gospel, and a tough question is when they say, well, how do you know? How do you really know? And you can deal with people that are atheists, and in the end, that's what they're going to come up with, even though they can't prove you he's not. But what do you do, church? What do you do? And this is going to be a little bit of, a, of, a, of teaching tonight. What do you do when somebody says that? Well, how do you know that he rose again from the dead? And that's when you need to get your church clothes off and say, let me tell you how I know. And then you give your testimony. Remember, the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimonies, the enemy will be defeated. I've grown up in church my whole life. Well, tell them that you still didn't get saved. You were in church your whole life. You still didn't get it. Tell them about the gambling problem that you had and nobody else knew about. Tell them about the time that you got really mad and cursed at your son. Mm -hmm. But, 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 I, but they know I go to church. I would, I would sound fake. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. This is real life stuff. Yes, right. This is real life stuff. I, literally, I've been in circles where everybody was saved and we were given testimonies. And every single one, these young kids went, well, grew up in church my whole life. And it's like, they were ashamed. They were ashamed that they didn't shoot dope. You know? I've, I've, seen, I've seen people look at me in my testimony and say, man, what a great testimony. No, it's a great God. But I don't want you to go do drugs so you have a testimony. Do you see what I'm saying? It's almost like the church has to feel like we need to be filthy with sin to, 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 to determine whether we can testify about God. Well, I was a drug addict my whole life. Yeah, well, God kept me from it. He would say, don't do that. Don't do that. I've never gone and almost lost my life as a drug addict. Praise God you didn't. Right. Why, why, why taste death when you don't have to? But what I talked about this morning, there's still the blood. Yeah. There is still a resurrection. There is still somebody who took your place at the cross. Right. And not only that, but because our preaching is not in vain and our faith not in vain, he rose again. Yeah. How do you know? Because he touched me. Because I've tried everything else. No, I didn't do drugs. No, I didn't drink my whole life. But at some point, I realized that I didn't have it all together. I realized that I was a liar, I was a gossip, and I was a cheat. I was married, but I'd still look at other women. Well, I thought you were a Christian. That's what I'm telling you. I'm, not a, I'm a Christian because he rose again. How do I know? I know because I called and he answered. 
Have you ever called? Well, there's no God. Well, then, then call him. Let's see. And that's what we do when we're in the present. We say, if you truly mean it, ask God, well, how do I know if, if, if I'm saved? Because he'll come. How do you know? Because Jesus says, anyone who comes to me, I will by no means turn away. We can have confidence when we go up to people that are broken, that are afflicted, or they've been in church their whole lives. We can have confidence. Why? Because of the gospel. Why? Because he rose again. The resurrection of God. Without that resurrection, it's pointless. So why do we just put it on the back burner? We try to witness through our own Christianity. That's failure. I have to show the Christ. I have to show them that I needed His mercy, that I needed His grace. And then people's hearts will be changed when, when they come to realize that you're not all hyped up as you think. But we're broke down people with an awesome God. And then we can truly proclaim that I am holy. Do you understand me? I used to, I used to fear that. Well, no, I'm not holy because, because I'm full of sin. Well, I thought he delivered me from sin. Well, you know, I used to teach people. They'd get saved and I'd say, now, now, now listen, now listen, brother. Now, now just get ready because you're going to mess up a lot. Welcome to the kingdom. You're condemned. You see what I'm saying? We tell people of the, of the glorious power of Jesus Christ that he rose again from the dead. It said if he didn't, you're, the sin is still upon us. But we've been freed from that. What we must preach is 1 John 2.1. That says, I tell you these things that you sin not. Now if you sin, there's an advocate. If you confess, he'll forgive you. But I'm preaching you this gospel tonight to tell you that when those people walk in, don't just get them saved, don't just get them spirit-filled and says, don't worry, you're going to mess up a lot. No, say, you separate yourself from sin. Don't go back to that lifestyle. Don't you dare go back to the drugs. I heard it says that don't you dare let them old devils get you. I'll tell you what, if I'm going to sin, and I'm not one of those preachers that says I haven't sinned since 19 blah, blah, blah. That's not me. But there's times where God has told me to do something and I disobeyed. And guess what? That's sin. In the end, disobedience is sin. That's what He wants above sacrifice. You can fast for 40 days and 40 nights, but if, but if you disobey Him, you're in the same place. What He wants is the obedience of His children. That's what He wants. He wants us to obey Him. And I'll tell you what, I, I, I used to lay my head down at night and do the typical prayer. I said, Father, I'm pretty sure that I did something today. Right? Who's praying that? I, I, I'm pretty sure that I, that, that I screwed up some way today. And I ask you to forgive me. And, and remember that the Bible says that, that the Lord is patient towards us. But one day, I felt the Holy Spirit speak. Who knows God speaks, Jesus speaks, and the Holy Spirit speaks. Okay? Just to make sure we're the right church. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, Son, do you have communion with me? Meaning, do we, do we talk with each other? And I said, Oh, Holy Spirit, yes. And I thank you. We need to thank the Holy Spirit. He was a gift to us. A precious gift. Jesus said, It's better that I leave because then He can come. Because now we're, we can be indwelled with the Spirit. Yes. Yes. So, so then he said that. He said, son, do we commune together? Do we talk together? I said, yes. And he said, what's one of my purposes? And <clears throat> who knows when God or the Holy Spirit Jesus asks you a question. It's for you to find out the answer. <laughs> yes. So I thought carefully. I went, you know, I went through my, my, my Bible logic in my head. And then I said, to convict me of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And he says, the Father and the Son love fellowship with you. And I was very humbled by that. I was very touched by that. And he says, if you sin, I will tell you. Yes. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. It's not this stuff. We need, to, we need to know the resurrection of God. 
We need to know it's so close that if we disobey or if we sin, immediately we're convicted. We don't put it off until nighttime. We don't put it off till bedtime. I'm not going to be able to work unless I get right with God. I disobeyed Him. I should have spoken. I didn't. Immediately the Spirit convicts me and says, you should have spoke then. And the Lord wanted to minister to them. And immediately I say, Father, I am sorry. I repent before you. I don't wait till I'm laying down on my bed like sin has passed me by because then I'm acting like the Holy Spirit's like me. The Holy Spirit's not like me. As soon as my fellowship with God is broken, and sin breaks fellowship with God. That's why we should teach people, don't sin. Don't sin. Live right with God. Live in peace with God. So then the conviction of the Holy Spirit, as soon as something is done, that they know they're convicted, and immediately, immediately, they come back and say, God, I love you. I'm sorry. And guess what God does? I love you. You're forgiven. Yes. You're forgiven. It's over. Let's move on. Why? Because he rose again from the dead. Yes, Our preaching is not in vain. We need to be bolder. There's a generation here that's older. And sometimes it's just like, well, you know, my time is up. All these young ones are so excited, you know. But who's going to tell the young ones yes. about the tough times? You know, who's going to come up to me with a wife and three kids and say, it's tight, isn't it? <sighs> yeah, it is. Let me tell you what God did. Come on. Yeah. Let me tell you about the power of his resurrection. Yes. Where we didn't have a meal and somebody knocked on the door and says, I don't know, but God just told me to get you a, a tray full of groceries. See, that, that older generation, you need to breathe that into the next generation. You need to tell us of his faithfulness. Because we're looking at it right in our face. We don't know what to do. Okay? The, the, the banks don't pay well these days. Okay? And three kids, it's tough. But I can't tell you the number of times where somebody with a little bit of gray hair came up to me and says, let me tell you something. I've been there. I've been there. And they didn't throw it in my face like, well, you'll just get over it. No. They said, when I was there, somebody else came up to me and picked me up. Why? Because he rose again. Yeah. We need to be a house that will testify of his faithfulness, yeah. of his truth, yeah. of all of his glory. Hallelujah. Why? Because he rose again. How do you know? I know. Amen. Oh, I know. <laughs> well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I said, have you ever dared Say, Jesus, if you're real, then I'll dare you to come into my life. Uh -huh. I know a couple of atheists, ex atheists. Uh -huh. Amen. Uh -huh. My brother was a devil. If I wasn't a Christian, I'd have hit him. He was just one of those. He was just one, always wanting to argue. My parents would always sit there and say, You two need to be lawyers. Because all you do is bicker and backbite. That's all you guys do. And finally, I got saved. And I'll, and, and I'll tell you something interesting. If we were going to talk about hardcore drugs like cocaine, everybody was like this to me. Why? Because I had accountability with everybody. But all of a sudden, I came home changed by the resurrected King Jesus. And guess what? Accountability? Out the window. My brother would sit there and go, Oh, you're deceived. You're just deceived. And literally, God, the Holy Spirit, told me, says, do not minister to your brother anymore. First thing I did is I rebuked that spirit. <laughs> and then it convicted me, and I went, oh, man, this is the real one. And he said, he will not listen to you right now. You only speak if I tell you to speak. Yes. So he would sit there, and my blood would be boiling. And God would say, keep silent, keep silent. Let, let what I'm doing show. Come on. Yeah. There's a quote that says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, speak. That's right. How do I know he's alive? Look at me. Yeah. Look at me. Because yeah. the person that's asking you, well, how do you know he's alive? They've already seen it in you, or else they wouldn't have asked. Come on. 
It's not your preaching that brings, brings strongholds down. It's the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. Amen. So we would sit there one day. One day I was sitting there with my brother. And finally I got my chance. The Holy Spirit said, speak. And I thought, I thought, man, it was going to be this. <laughs> Boom! This sermon. And all I said was this. I, and I, I gave that test when I said, you know, if I was talking about hard or drugs, everybody believes me. But when I come about the changing power of Jesus Christ that each and every single one of you have seen, I have no accountability. Daniel, I dare you. I dare you to call on his name. On the name of Jesus Christ. And he said years later, he said, when you said that to me, I was so enraged that I said, yeah, fine, I will, and I'll show you. Uh, what is it? Book clubs just boom. That's all God wanted. And so he did. I don't know how he did it. I don't know when he did it, but I'm sure he had his fist up in the air and says, I'm going to prove my little brother wrong. I'm going to show you, Jesus, if you're real, then manifest yourself to me. Next thing you know, he's in Baltimore, Maryland, sitting down getting prophesied over, crying like a little baby. Crying like a little baby. Uh -huh. See, he met the real Jesus. Amen. He met the one that you can look for his body and you will not find it until you see him in glory. Yes. Why? Because he rose again from the dead. I had confidence not in my testimony, not even in my Christian walk. I had confidence knowing that God is a God of his word. I knew that if I would lead my brother to the word, then God would save him through the word. And that's how I got saved. I, I didn't get saved by the fire of preaching. I got saved because I started reading the word. Uh -huh. And when, when I read Isaiah 53, verse 5, the, that he will be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our inequities, the chastising of our peace was upon him. And when he said, by his wounds we are healed. And I learned that, I, I, I believe it was 500 to 800 years before Christ came. I sat back and I said, God, I want to hear from you like that. And he just whispered and said, son, you can, but you might have to shut up first. Because I was young. So I'd get in the prayer closet. I'd pray in tongues for an hour. And I'd be tired. Because I was, I was, I was praying just to say I prayed. That's it. And I'd sit there in my prayer closet and I'd go through the whole family list, whole family list. And I wouldn't shut up for one second. And finally, the Lord just convicted me. He said, hey, hey. He said, when you pray, there's times that I want to talk. There's times where you'll pray for something and I have the answer. But you don't pause. Because the whole time I'm saying, all right, that's, that's only... I thought that was 30 minutes, but that was only four minutes. So let me just keep going here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for... And then I would sit there and pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the church. Man, I'm hungry. I wonder what's in the lunchroom tonight. Oh, Father, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. At the time, I just say, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. But God was sitting there ready to answer me. So I've learned that what, when David talks about that, I will meditate upon his word. Yes. Meditation is just the thoughts the thoughts of His glory. That's when I truly learned who God was, was when I learned how to worship. When I learned that it wasn't about the goosebumps, it wasn't about how I felt, it was about, Father, is this a sweet savor unto you? Has, has my praise and, and, and my humility laid down before you, has that exalted you? And God is so awesome because he rose from the dead that while I exalt him, while I praise him, he comes down from his throne and he touches me. Yeah. He touches me. I've been healed. My wife literally was born with a twisted valve in her heart. It's called a mitral valve prolapse. A prophet of the Lord came into the house and didn't know anything about her. Just kept saying, God, I'm gonna give you, God says, I'm going to give you a new heart. God says, I'm going to give you a new heart. They found out that she had a valve. So every year they would go to the doctor because they didn't want to do surgery since she was so young. So every year, if it didn't change, they were just going to keep the same routine. If there was any pain, that, that she would have to be rushed in. And she came in one year. 
He's alive. Mm -hmm. He rose again from the dead. Yes, the lady said, why are you in here? And so she explained, uh, mitral valve prolapse. And listen, it's a twisted valve in her heart. There's nothing that can be done unless surgery. Something's not right. Something not, she, leaves, she leaves the office. Well, my, you know, she didn't know what was going on. I think she was 15 or 16 years old. The doctor comes in. What, what's going on here? What's going on? He comes in and says, I don't know. You tell me. We need to talk to your mother. What's going on here? They're like, doctor, you tell us what's going on. He said, here's two views of the heart. This was last year's. This is this year's. And the valve is perfect. You know why? Because he's alive. He's alive. I don't need to prove it to you. You need to accept it. And when these drug addicts come into the house, when these broken people come into the house, you, we're not going to put on our proof pants that we're going to prove to you that Jesus is alive. What we're going to do is we're going to exalt his name. Yes. We're going to lift up his name and he's going to come. He's going he's to do what he promised. He will inhabit the praises of his people. And then he's going to start, they're going to start looking at you and saying, Man, why are you so happy? I know you, you used to do drugs with me. Why are you so happy? Jesus Christ is alive. Well, how do you know? You know because you see me. Yes. Come to church. And I'm one person. I don't preach church. Because you can be in church and go to hell. You can be in church your whole life. You have to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. You have to believe without a shadow of a doubt that he resurrected. Because there's a lot of church folks that Jesus says when the persecution comes, their love will wax cold. We can't be those people. We know the truth. It's time that we buckle down and proclaim his resurrection. Yes. Not with a t-shirt, with a life that has been crucified. That's the purpose. That's what Paul did in Galatians 6. He says, I have crucified myself to the world. And the world itself is crucified to me. Come on. It's no nothing of the flesh. That's the preaching that we don't get bound up in sin. There's times where I'm going to disobey God, but I don't want to disobey God. But I will not go back to who I was. I will not disgrace the resurrection of Christ. I will not touch the drugs again. Yeah. And we got to get that mindset. If you're a recovering addict, there is no such thing as a relapse. What are you going to go back to? There is nothing else. Because he is alive. He was alive just like when you got saved. He's, he should be more powerful now. Yes. Because if we die daily, I think it's Philippians 1.21 says, but I die daily. If we get up and slap down the casket and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, the flesh of Patrick Lager is dead. Come, Come forth alive in Christ. Romans 6, 4 talks about baptism and says, For we are buried with him by baptism into death. Even as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. The resurrection gives us the power to do anything for God. Because nobody else conquered death. Come on. He was the first among many brethren. Yes. He was the first. The little, the, the, the child that uh, Elijah raised from the dead lived a life, but eventually, you know where they died? That's right. Elisha, the same thing. Come on. Lazarus, the same thing. But the beauty of his resurrection is that not only is it so powerful in this life, but to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yes. You see, after he rose again, after he died, he went down. And then he resurrected from his glorious self and went into the presence of the Father. And you know what he did? Talks about it in Hebrews. He came and grabbed that blood and went. Yes. That's right. Amen. On the altar, which Moses saw in heaven. And blood stains. 
So when we go up to heaven and we see him as he is, I'm going to look down at that altar. I'm going to bow to my God and I'm going to see the blood that set me free. I'm going to see the blood that let me in. I'm going to see the blood that restored me. I've got two babies in heaven waiting on us. Had two miscarriages. That tough was, that was hard. And if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, we wouldn't have made it. We wouldn't have made it. And I tell this story to say this, that when I come up to heaven, you know who I want to see? I want to see my babies. I've seen a vision of them before. A little boy and a little girl. My, my, my three-year-old or four-year-old at the time saw a vision in heaven. We named them Joy and Faith because the first baby brought us a lot of joy. And the second one just built our faith. Because, because, yes, they went to heaven, but God grabbed us and He held us every tear He was there. Yes. And my little boy said, Daddy, joy is a boy and faith is a baby. He was three years old. He couldn't know that. But see, the Father let us know. He let Mom and Dad know. And when I get up to the kingdom of God, I want to see them babies. I want to grab them babies. And I tell you what, I think they're going to run up to me. But you know what's the first thing I'm going to do? Guys, just wait one second. And I'm going to go up to the one whose feet were filled with holes. Amen. And I'm going to stand there and I'm going to say, Lord Jesus, I honor you. Yes. I honor you, Lord God, who conquered the grave, who resurrected from the dead, that I could be free, that I could have babies on earth and in heaven. Yeah. How glorious is this God we serve? Yeah. How awesome is He that He would do it? Paul said that in Corinthians, but Jesus had already said it. I think it's uh, John eleven twenty five. 25. Pretty simple, pretty bold, red letters. Who knows you can't mess with the red letters? Yeah. Yeah. And what you can do with the red letters? I am the resurrection and the life. Yes. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. How do you know? Because he said it. And what he said, it is. Amen. Is it 1125? Who they got it? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Because of that, I'm clean 10 years. And I'm keeping going. Yes. I was a drug addict for 10. Now I'm clean for 10. You tell me what suited me better. How do you know? How do you know? Because he's alive. Well, how do you know he's alive? Because I called. He answered. And he just didn't answer. But he stepped into my life. He came and brought me. I've been in church my whole life. How do you know? Because when I called as a church folk that was still full of sin, he stepped in and set me free. Yes. Well, do you really know he's alive? Yes, because now my babies serve him. And they've got ministries. And they're leading people going across the oceans to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he died, he was buried, and then he rose again. Yes. Are you ready for the people to come in here? Yes. Are you ready? Because thus saith the Lord, it's coming. It's coming. Yes. It is coming. It is coming. Futile means incapable of producing any useful result. It's, it's pointless. It's foolishness. But Paul also said he chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. The men who could practically quote the entire Old Testament could not see the King of Glory. Yes. But a bunch of bone fishermen sure got a hold of it. Oh, they got a hold of it to the point that people thought they were lunatics, people thought they were liars, but they said, put the nails in me. I'm going upside down because I know that he rose again. Paul never saw it with his own eyes, but he said, I've seen it in the spirit and I know it. Remember on the road to Damascus, Paul came off his horse and it says, Saul, Saul, why thou persecutest me? It's hard for thee to kick against the goat. And he said, Lord, what shall you have me do? He recognized 
the power and the glory in that voice that he knew that Jesus Christ rose again. Yes, that's right. We shall be a house that knows that Jesus Christ rose again. Yes. Come on. Let's stand. Hallelujah. 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 We give you glory, Father. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Yes. He rose from the dead for you and I. He rose by the glory of the Father, the power given unto Him by the Father. And now we have been blessed to carry this gospel. And, and, and literally Paul said it's not written. It's not written by the hands of men, but the finger of God, not on stones, but on your very hearts. Yeah. How do you know? Look at my heart, because he wrote it on there. Yeah. It's time to testify of what Jesus Christ has done for you when you were a Christian your whole entire life. It's time for those who have been broken in addiction to step out and not live in sin. If you're living with a person unmarried, get out of it. Quit living with them. Live for Christ. And if he wants you to get married, then get married. And live in holy matrimony according to the scriptures. Why? Because he rose again for you to do it. He doesn't want to set you free and then have you have a crutch for every kind of sin. He wants you to be set apart. Why? Because people will look at you and they'll look at the gospel in your life and they'll make a decision based according to who your God is. And I believe that our God is the one who resurrected again. There is no other but Jesus Christ that conquered death. The love of God was shed abroad in our hearts and we testify now. If anybody wants prayer, if there's anybody who, who has never given their lives to Jesus Christ, I want you to come up. If you've given your life to God, you had a salvation experience, but you know that you're not living it, that you're not living a resurrected Christian life, I want you to come up and we're going to stand in agreement that you cast off the old man. Amen. He that is in Christ is a new creation. The old man has passed away. Behold, all things become new. Hallelujah. And God is willing to minister to you in any way. If you want to come up for prayer, the pastor's here. If the Lord moves prophetically, we'll move prophetically. If He doesn't, we won't. We don't move unless He does.